Uh, welcome to the Kubernetes storage deep dive. Before starting, I want to ask a round of applause for Xing and Patrick. Uh, today they got one community award. Uh, it's the Catwood or Chapwood. Uh, chop with something with water. Carry water. Carry water. Yeah. Carry yeah. water yeah, let's also water. wish her good luck with that thing in the airport. <laughs> right. <laughs> thanks. Uh, so, uh, thanks for coming today. We are going to give a deep dive of Kubernetes 6 storage. My name is Xin Yang. I work at uh, VMware in the cloud native storage team. And my name is Mauricio. I work in the Antos storage team at Google. Here's uh, today's agenda. We will talk about uh, who we are, what we did in 1.25 and 1.26 release. And Marisha will give a deep dive of CSI Windows. And we will talk about how to get involved. Six Storage has two co chairs Sad Ali from Google and myself are the co chairs. And we also have Michelle from Google and Ian from Red Hat. They are two tech leads. There are also many other contributors in Six Storage. Uh, so we have more than 5,000 uh, members in the Six Storage Slack channel. Uh, we also have uh, several other channels. We have a channel for Cozy, for CSI, and CSI Windows. Uh, we also have regular bi-weekly meetings. And we have uh, unique approvals for Six Storage owned repos and packages. What we do in Six Storage is defined in our charter. So Six Storage is a, a special interest group focuses on providing storage to containers running in a Kubernetes cluster. In Six Storage, most notable features include persistent volume claims, persistent volumes, storage class and dynamic provisioning. We have volume plugins. In addition to persistent volumes, that persist data Beyond the post life cycle, we also have ephemeral volumes such as uh, secrets, config maps, downward APIs, empty doors. Their life cycle are tied with the post life cycle. And we also have container storage interface, CSI, that allows uh, storage vendors to write a plugin and have it work uh, in Kubernetes and other container orchestration systems. CSI is for block and file storage. Now we also have a COSI, Container Object Storage Interface. That's an alpha feature introduced in 1.25, that that's object storage support in Kubernetes. So first, let me talk about what we did in 1.25 release. We have a few GA features. The first feature moved to GA in 1.25 is CSI inline ephemeral volume. This feature was introduced back in 1.15 release. So CSI inline ephemeral volume, just like other ephemeral volumes, it can be used to uh, store scratch space as, uh, for, the, for the pods. Uh, one most uh, important difference between this uh, ephemeral volume and other types is that this is uh, provided by a CSI driver. Uh, and the special CSI driver, meaning that you have to write a CSI driver just for this purpose, or you need to modify your existing driver uh, to support this feature. To use this feature in the CSI driver spec, you need to specify volume lifecycle modes as ephemeral, and in the pod, you need to specify the volume type as CSI, and specify driver name and volume attributes. A CSI driver is suitable to be used as an ephemeral volume uh, if it's uh, built for special purpose and the need per volume custom parameters, like a um, driver that provides secrets to a pod. For example, secret store CSI driver is a good example of that. Another example is a cert manager CSI driver. A CSI driver is not suitable to be used as a CSI inline ephemeral volume uh, if it needs to support features such as volume snapshotting, cloning, expansion, 
if a provision is not limited to the local node, or if you need some uh, uh, volume attributes that are only uh, that are supposed to be restricted to the uh, the admins only, like the parameters in a storage class. And also, if you want to uh, persist your data beyond uh, the post life cycle, you, that's also not suitable for this feature. The second feature moved to GA is the local admiral storage capacity isolation. This feature was introduced back in 1.7 release, so it's been quite a while now. Pods use uh, uh, admiral storage for scratch space or for caching or logging, saving logs. But the pods could be evicted because other pods are filling the local storage space. So this feature allows users to manage local admiral storage just as they manage their memory and CPU. Each container of the pod can specify the limits and the requests. So if the pod uses storage more than what is specified in the limits, the pod will get evicted. You can also use this uh, to manage the resource quota for local ephemeral storage. Currently, this feature cannot be used for a CSI driver, but recently there were discussions on extending this feature to support a CSI inline ephemeral volume that I just uh, talked about a minute ago. In 1.25, we also have a few alpha P features. The first one is a secure Linux relabeling with mount options. There is already a feature that allows us to skip the uh, volume ownership and permission change at mount time to speed up the pod startup time. But that feature will not work if the system has secure Linux enabled. So that's why we introduced this feature to mount volumes with the correct secure Linux context to avoid recursive change of files on the, on the volume to speed up the pod startup time. And the second uh, other feature is a node expense secret. It is typical for a storage system to require credentials to be passed in through a CSI driver for volume operations. That includes volume expansion. Volume expansion can happen on the controller side or the node side or both. From the controller side, we already have a way to pass in the secret uh, from the CSI driver. So now in 1.25, we also added this feature for the secrets to be passed in to CSI driver um, when the volume, happen volume expansion happening on the node side, when the file system is resized. And the third feature is a, a reconcile default storage class assignment. This feature allows the existing PVCs without storage class names specified to be updated to use the new default storage class when that storage class becomes available. And the fourth feature uh, became alpha in 1.25 is uh, Object Storage API COSY. COSY uh, adds uh, new Kubernetes APIs to provision buckets and also allow pods to access those buckets. Cozy component includes a controller manager that binds the Cozy created buckets to bucket claims. There is a sidecar that watches the Kubernetes API objects and calls the Cozy driver to provision or delete buckets. And the Cozy driver implements gRPC interfaces, communicates with the storage backend to provision buckets or delete buckets. There are two sets of uh, COSI APIs introduced here. We have a bucket, bucket claim, and bucket class that's uh, very similar to PV, PVC, and storage class. A bucket represents a physical bucket on the storage backend, and a bucket claim is a user's request for a bucket that's in the user's namespace and the bucket class uh, that specifies the type of the bucket that you want to provision. And the second set of uh, APIs are uh, bucket access and bucket access class. That is for 
the uh, pod to get access to the bucket. So now let me talk about what we are working on in 1.26 release. In 1.26 release, we also have some features that are targeting GA. Uh, so we have delegate FS group to CSI driver moved, is targeting GA in 1.26 release. Uh, so in the, in the pod security context, there is a FS group setting that you must specify so that uh, the volume is readable and writable by the pod if the pod runs as a non-root user. And based on the FS group, Kubernetes will recursively change the uh, ownership and permissions of all the volumes on that pod, unless if the FS, uh, change, FS group change policy setting specified to skip it. However, not every CSA driver can modify the volume ownership or permissions. For example, uh, NFS type or other volume type that does not support Unix style uh, permission changes. That's why we introduced this feature to let a CSI driver to opt out. So there are three different settings for this uh, FS group policy in CSI driver spec. By default, it is uh, read by once with FS type that means we'll examine that at month time and determine whether we need to apply modification or not. Uh, the second one is a file. That means always apply modification. And the, the third one is none. That allows the CSR driver to opt out and never apply modifications. We also have a few features targeting data in 1.26 release. Uh, the first one is the control volume mode conversion between source and target. So we have a use case for backup and restore. Sometimes the backup software needs to change the volume mode from file system to block to support efficient backups. However, that could lead to a potential security problem. That's why we added this feature to prevent unauthorized volume mode conversion. And we also have a reconciled default switch class assignment that we are targeting beta in 1.26. And the third one is a, a project we co-owned with SIG apps, auto removal PVCs created by safe assets. This, uh, this uh, adds an option to allow PVCs created by safe assets to be removed automatically. And also we have a non-graceful no shutdown feature targeting beta in 1.26. So this is a feature we introduced in 1.24. This allows stable workloads to fail over to a different node after the origin node is uh, shut down non-gracefully. Uh, a node shutdown is uh, graceful only if a kubelet can detect that. And kubelet depends on system D's inhibitor lock to detect a shutdown. However, not every system supports this mechanism. So if it's not supported, Kubli does not detect that, then it becomes a non-graceful no shutdown. Uh, this feature, the graceful no shutdown feature also requires uh, two grace period config parameters in Kubli. If uh, those are not configured properly, then this feature also will not work. Uh, so that's why we also need this non-graceful no shutdown uh, when non graceful no shutdown happens, uh, if you don't have, if you don't do any intervention, then your workload could be stuck on the shutdown node forever um, without moving to another running node. To use this feature, uh, you first need to enable the feature gate and uh, make sure that the node is really shut down and apply a out of service taint on that node. After that, the port, uh, the port GC controller will forcefully delete the pods, and the attach-detach controller will forcefully detach these volumes. After that, the workload will move successfully to another node. So right now we are targeting beta, and after that, depending on user feedback, we do plan to move this feature to GA eventually. And this feature right now uh, requires a manual uh, user intervention. You need to manually apply this taint 
So we are also looking at how to automate this in our next steps. We had a session about this on Wednesday, so uh, you can check out the video recording if you're interested. And in 1.26, we also have a few features targeting alpha. Uh, the first one is the provision volumes from cross namespace snapshot that allows a PVCs to be provisioned from a volume snapshot in a different namespace. And we also uh, have this volume group and the volume group snapshot feature, which introduces new APIs to manage multiple volumes together and I provide a volume group snapshot API to take a, a snapshot of a volume group. So here's a table that shows the CSI migration. Uh, Six storage has been working on this for several releases now. In 1.25, the core CSI migration moved to GA. We also have several drivers, uh, including OpenStack Cinder, Azure Disk, AWS EVS, GCPD, moved to GA. And Azure File and vSphere are also targeting GA in 1.26 release. So you can take a look of this table uh, and find out the CSM migration status. I also have this uh, table here that shows the entry storage driver removal. These uh, drivers do not go through the CSM migration process. So with that, I'm going to um, hand it over to Marisha, who's going to give us a deep dive on CSI Windows. All right, thank you, Xin. Okay, so let's first look at Kubernetes, Windows, and CSI. Uh, on the diagram in the right, we see a cluster that has two, win two node pools, a Linux node pool and a Windows node pool. The idea is that Windows workloads run in the Windows node pool. Kubernetes supports three uh, Windows server operating systems. Those are the long-term servicing channel 2019, 2022. And it also supports the semi-annual channel. Um, the long-term servicing channel has releases every two to three years. The semi-annual channel, I think it's being discontinued. Um, we also see in a Kubernetes cluster that is running uh, Windows a Windows node pool that the control plane components are still running in Linux. So uh, all of the components that you are aware of, the API server, the queue scheduler, the queue control manager, all of those are still in the control plane. And in CSI, we have three sets of uh, RPC services representing the three components that CSI drivers need to implement, the node component, the identity component, and the controller component. Um, so the controller component is still running in uh, the control plane. But for operations that need to run in the node component, that's where we need support for Windows too. So in CSI, there are three components that um, need to be working in Windows too. Those are the node component of the CSI driver, liveness probe, and node driver registrar. Those two last ones, liveness probe and node driver registrar, are maintained by Kubernetes CSI and the CSI driver is maintained by the uh, uh, storage provider. Um, also, Kubernetes is minimally, uh, uh, it, it doesn't tell you how you should deploy your solution into the cluster. And a usual solution to deploy the node component into the cluster is to use a daemon set. And um, in order to avoid having two different images in the Linux daemon set and in the Windows daemon set, we can use um, multi-arc build pipeline uh, where we create images for both operating systems and tie them together with an OCI image manifest. That way both, uh, both daemon sets refer to the same image and then it's in the node where the uh, decision to take the right image is taken. Okay, so let's look at what happens uh, in CSI under the hood. There are um, calls that the CSI spec defines. Uh, in this diagram on the right, we see one case for, uh, for the life cycle of a dynamically provisioned volume. What happens when uh, 
when a workload requests a PVC is that there are components in the control plane that uh, will receive uh, requests from CSI sidecars. So these are calls uh, that should be implemented by the controller component of the CSI driver, the one that is create volume and controller publish volume in the red uh, uh, rectangle there. Um, and as I mentioned, those are still happening in, in Linux. Um, but for Windows, we're focused on the blue box, which has four operations. So there are two operations for setup. The first one is node stage volume and node publish volume. So I think it's worth mentioning what happens in Linux so that we can understand what is the difference with Linux, or with Windows, sorry. So in, in Linux, um, what happens when a device is attached to a node, we need to format it. And this happens in this node stage volume um, call. The CSI driver usually uses a library from Kubernetes called Kubernetes Mount Utils that has utilities to execute the MKFS command in Linux. And also to, uh, well, that's for to format it and to mount it, it uses the mount command. Uh, in Windows, we don't have these commands, but we have similar PowerShell commands. So the workflow in, in Linux, oh, in Windows is to create a Windows volume. We format it to NTFS. We create a partition access path in the node, and that's called the global mount. Uh, the next step is node publish volume, which is to make this uh, volume available to the pod. Uh, in Linux, this is done with a bind mount. But in Windows, because there is no support for it, we do it with a symlink to the partition access path. And this is called the pod mount. That is for the setup step. And at that point, the workloads can start using uh, the PV. Then at some point, the workload will, um, will be out of the cluster. And we will go through the reverse steps, which, which are to tear down the volume. So um, in Linux, this is done with a U mount command, but in uh, Windows, it's done by reversing the steps above, which are removing the sim link in node unpublished volume, and in node unstaged volume, we remove the partition access path. OK, so uh, in addition, in Windows, these operations, the volume uh, format and mount operations, are privileged operations. and they can't be done through a Windows container. There is a ras an asterisk there because it's now doable. I will talk about that in the next slide. But when we started working on this, there was no support to do that. And as a workaround, a lot of components in Kubernetes that run in Windows usually do this through proxies. And we also have a project called CSI Proxy, uh, which is a binary that runs in the uh, host. So uh, when CSI proxy starts, it creates name pipes in the host. You could imagine that this is all happening in the Windows node. Um, and yeah, CSI proxies, uh, the CSI proxies bi binary is running at that point. Uh, next, we deploy the CSI driver. And the CSI driver needs to communicate with the CSI proxy binary through a library that is also an artifact of the CSI proxy project. So um, we have multiple versions of it, because uh, it could be possible that uh, a, a driver used, uh, used the beta version while, while uh, uh, we were still working on making this uh, B1. And then at some point, it became B1. And now we, we need also need to manage this multiple version problem. And finally, it comes time to those operations that I mentioned before that ex are executed from the kubelet. So the kubelet will call node stage volume. It will go to the CSI driver. The CSI driver will try to format and mount the, the device. It will use the CSI proxy library. And it will uh, talk with the uh, CSI proxy implementation that does all of those commands that I mentioned above. So it's worth not noticing that this, even though this is the current CSI proxy architecture, we're planning on modifying this so that it's easier. And this is where I'll, I'll um, talk about host process containers next. Uh, a few of the drawbacks of this model that are not 
only for storage are for most of the uh, proxy components in, in uh, Kubernetes is that we have an additional component that we have to maintain, which is CSI proxy. And it's difficult to maintain, as I mentioned, we may have new features and those need to be part of a new, uh, new release. So um, that eventually becomes hard to maintain. And there is also a tiny increase in latency because now um, we have to make calls from the CSI driver to CSI proxy through the name pipes. All of those calls are done with gRPC and there is this protobuf serialization, deserialization, and so on. So that, that's a tiny bit of increasing latency. Um, that's a small drawback of this design. Okay, so um, luckily the SIG Windows team started working at the same time while, while we were working on this, um, on this feature called Win Windows Host Process Pod, which is a way to run uh, pods in Windows as a host process container. This is different to a privileged container in Linux. Um, it, it's actually running as a process in the Windows host. And one of the caveats is that there is no file system isolation. So this means that the cluster should have additional policies so that workloads cannot become uh, host process pods because they could access uh, the volumes of all of the other um, workloads. So that's something to keep in mind. So um, in addition, if uh, now that we, we know of this feature, if a CSI driver becomes a host process pod, then the CSI driver itself can run these privileged storage operations. It doesn't, go, it doesn't need to go through the uh, CSI proxy binary. But CSI driver still, uh, the CSI driver still needs the format and mount functionality that is in CSI proxy. And the current plan is to transform all of that code that we had in the previous slide to a library so that CSI drivers can include it and perform the format and mount operations directly. And with this, the CSI drivers become super easy to develop and deploy because they are similar to, to, to the Linux counterpart where uh, you just bump the, the image and you, you have all of the format amount functionality with having to maintain an additional component. This initiative is being tracked in, the, in, in that enhancement issue 3636. Okay, so this slide is about uh, people that have already implemented Windows support in their CSI drivers. On the left, we have the current implementation, and on the right, we have the new implementation. We wanted to have to, to reach a step where we had as minimal changes as possible. So, uh, as we can see, it, it's just a, a, it's just renaming the imports in in the in the file where uh, the calls are used. That is one change, and the other change is that the CSI driver deployment needs to have additional uh, host process related spec fields. And in, in these drivers, we also mount the name pipes in, in, the, in the pod. So all of those fields are also removed because we no longer have the name pipes. And that should be it. So I would like to thank Alexander Ding from Brown University for the work that he already did in uh, CSI Proxy to make this work. And I also encourage everyone who has a CSI driver and doesn't have a Windows implementation yet to add Windows support to their CSI driver. I think it's now a great time you don't have to support um, the, an additional proxy component. So um, I would also like to thank SIG Windows for working on this because they enabled us to remove a lot of code that, are, that is needed. With that, I'll pass it back to Shink. Thanks, Mauricio. So uh, on this uh, SIG storage homepage, we have a lot of information for it to get started. Uh, there are some video recordings, including some of the sessions from previous KubeCons. Some are like one-on-one -on -one sessions, so check it out. And um, we have bi-weekly meetings on Thursdays. We have mailing list and Slack channel. So if you're interested, please uh, join us and get involved. And I uh, have included a few resources here. Yeah, this is the QR code for the session. Please uh, leave feedback. 
This is the end of the session. Thank you all for coming. Are there any questions? Oh, uh, no. Could you raise your hand, please? Right. Oh, it, it's coming. Uh, I wanted to know if you have a reference implementation of a CSI driver for Windows. So, I mean, a sample CSI, which does the mount and so on. Sure. So um, there are at least three, three CSI drivers that have support for Windows. Those are the cool GC persistent disk CSI driver. There is the Azure file CSI driver, the Azure oh. disk CSI driver. EBS also has an implementation. So all of those are under the hood using CSI proxy. Okay. And is there variation between across them? Because the only place where I see in a node related uh, location is how do you find out where the disk is attached pretty much? The rest of the code should be similar, right? Where you support NTFS and then mount it. Correct. Yeah, the okay. code is very similar across all of these drivers. Okay. Thanks. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Um, how long will the CSI proxy support running as a service? versus uh, as a library? That's a great question. Um, I wrote the timeline for it on the KEP. We are thinking about uh, having it on maintenance mode uh, because of the drawbacks that I mentioned. But that's still open in the KEP. So if the community wants to keep it open for features, we could still support both. But my take right now is to Keep it in maintenance mode and just go all on the library mode. Perfect. I just saw your cap, so I'll, uh, I'll take a look at that. All right. Thanks. We have time for one more question. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank you. coming.